All right. So now we're going to go over here just quickly, guys, the factors that affect plant growth. Because tomorrow we're going to be doing that little activity to design okay, our own lab experiment that would test the effect of one of these factors okay, on, uh, on the growth of a plant. We talked about yesterday that factors can be non-living. That is, they are abiotic or they can be living. That is biotic factors. Okay, so living things in, that could affect an organism could be predatory animals. Okay, if you're a plant, that means like deer and elk and cows. Okay, those are your predators. Um, they could also mean diseases. Okay, if you're a, let's say, tobacco plant, there's viruses that can affect the tobacco plant called the tobacco mosaic virus, and it makes the leaves get all funky, and then the, the uh, leaves are no good for whatever they use nicotine plants for. Okay, um, and then uh, there could also be parasites. Okay, things like that that might grow in your roots, molds, fungus, okay, things like that, right, that, uh, that could affect you. Those would be biotic components of your environment, okay. Abiotic factors or components of your environment would be the kind of the big things that we would be able to more easily test, okay, sunlight, water, temperature, right, and stuff like that that would be kind of more common sense. All right, so um, we're going to look at how they affect it and uh, move on from there. Okay, so the abiotic components are the non-living parts, okay, of the uh, ecosystem, okay, including, obviously, sunlight, okay, availability of water, temperature, obviously it's not good growing conditions if the temperature is below freezing consistently, um, nutrients within the soil, okay, what the soil is made out of, is it sandy, rocky, loamy, clayish, like what is it made out of? All of those have different abilities to support plant growth, okay? And again, any food chains that might be in the area, okay? If you are a plant, obviously this little guy here is your predator, okay? He looks terribly intimidating and scary, okay? But uh, if you're grass, he might be, okay? Or if you're a tree that makes nuts or something, he, yeah, would be your worst enemy because he's coming for you, all right? Um, the, the fox, you probably wouldn't be quite so scared of. Okay, so these include, and these are listed kind of in the, their order, not so much order of importance, but sort of kind of order of what you might see in the environment, okay? Temperature is obviously somewhat affected by sunlight, okay? So we're indirectly saying sunlight here. We'll directly say sunlight in a minute, okay? But temperature is probably the most important factor because it's affected by sunlight, and it affects everything else, especially this one. Temperature affects the availability of water. Obviously, obviously, if it's very, very hot all the time, it could also be very, very dry. Not always. The tropical rainforest is also very, very hot, and it's very, very wet. I would say very, very cold would be the bigger concern with temperature and how it affects water availability. Because once it drops below freezing, is water available anymore? No. You cannot, a plant cannot transport ice. Okay? It can only transport liquid water. And as soon as the temperature drops below freezing, a plant's ability to transport water is essentially cut off. Right? Because the water is frozen at that point. Right? So that means no photosynthesis is going to be occurring during those types of times. Okay? Plants have no ability to regulate their body temperature. Their temperature is whatever the outside temperature is. And most plants cannot tolerate Okay, freezing temperatures, and by most I mean like worldwide most. So many of your tropical plants, okay, grasses, things like that, they don't tolerate, they go dormant. Okay, yeah, spruce trees and stuff, they keep their leaves during freezing, but are they carrying out any photosynthesis? No, because again, they can't transport water, okay, when the water is frozen. All right, so uh, temperatures can become too cold, they lose water. Temperatures become too high, they lose water, okay? Uh, so temperature, like we said, affects the availability okay, of water. And water is probably the second most important resource a plant requires other than sunlight. Okay, is what's in the water also important? Yeah, you could even have too much water, agreed? Right? Water availability doesn't always mean too little. Most of the time it is too little, okay? But occasionally it can also be too much. Okay, sunlight provides energy that drives all ecosystems, not nearly all, essentially all, okay? All, although plants and other photosynthetic uh, organisms are the only ones that can use this energy directly. Here's the other thing, though. Does the availability of light change? Well, here it does. 
Does it change, let's say, in Ecuador? Or Brazil? Not as much, right? When you're close to the equator, you get 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of darkness every day all year long. Okay? I remember once going to Hawaii, and this lady was complaining in August that the days were getting so short. And I was like, what? I was like, well, yeah, we only get 11 hours and 45 minutes of sunshine a day now. I'm like, really? You come up to Canada in December when we get four hours and tell me that 11 hours and 45 minutes isn't enough. You got no clue. <laughs> okay? So, most plants require somewhere between 8 and 14 hours of sunlight a day, okay, in order to function properly. Some plants obviously can tolerate less, some plants can tolerate more. It's usually the same plants because they have to, okay, because during the winter months they get essentially nothing, and during the summer months they essentially get nothing but sunlight, okay. So that is a big factor. And for plants that have seasonality, it influences their behaviors. When they would produce seeds, when they would produce fruit, when they will go dormant, when they will gain leaves, lose leaves, all of that kind of stuff okay, is all determined by length of day because it is the best determining factor. Right? But it does obviously affect their rate of photosynthesis, which is the cue for plants to do certain things. Okay, wind. Wind's a huge factor for plants. Okay, because A, it can help to it can help speed evaporation, okay? And if evaporation is sped up, then there's less water, okay? But also, it can affect how a plant grows, okay? If you've ever gone uh, hiking in like Banff or Kananaskis or places like that and you get up sort of near the tree line, you'll often see Douglas fir trees and stuff that are grown in this shape. You can see that there's no branches on this side. There's only branches on the other side, okay? If we were looking at that tree from the top, this would be the trunk of the tree, and there would only be branches in this area here, in this sector, right? They usually get grow like that, and then they get bent kind of over, almost like a, like a cane. They kind of bend like this, and they only grow their branches in here because it protects them from the wind, especially in the wintertime when the wind is carrying crystals of ice that are very abrasive and hard on the plants, okay? So by growing in here, they create a windbreak with their own trunk that protects their leaves. We call this crummels form of the Douglas fir tree, okay? And it's an adaptation to wind, all right? Now, does that affect how much photosynthesis that plant can carry out? Yeah, because it's only got branches and leaves on one side, okay? It has to do that because otherwise they just get broken off, okay, or damaged by ice crystals and stuff like that. So it's, it's better to grow this way kind of with the wind, okay, as opposed to trying to fight the wind. And if you go down like Lethbridge and places like that, you often see that lots of the deciduous trees lean with the wind, okay? They just grow that way because it's always windy. All right, also wind chill. Wind chill doesn't affect plants quite as much as it affects animals, okay? But certainly the effects of wind can increase how temperature feels, right? Like there's lots of times you go outside and, you know, the, the weather network or the app on your phone says it's only 10 degrees, it's minus 10. You're like, ah, minus 10 is not so bad. And you walk out the door and it feels like it's minus 50, okay? Because it's blowing 30 clicks an hour right out of the north, okay? And it increases the rate of evaporation off of your skin. And that increases, okay, how cold you feel. All right, um, rocks and soil, okay? Physical structure, pH, mineral composition, rocks in the soil, okay? Limit the distribution of plants and the animals that feed on them, right? So they have a huge effect. Soil has a huge effect on what kind of organisms, not just plants, live in an area, okay? We can see that when we look at the mountains because we can see that where the trees end, okay? We can see the tree line. Above the tree line, the soil is too thin to support large plants. Okay, because it's cold, frozen most of the year. It's not very well developed because it doesn't collect there. Soil tends to collect in lower areas first, okay, because water washes it down. Um, and so you get kind of poor soils like this above the tree line. All right, now I took my trowel here and tried to show how deep that soil was. You can see it's not very deep. In fact, I had to prop a rock behind the trowel to hold the trowel up because I couldn't stick the trowel in the dirt far enough for it to stand up on its own, okay? Now, is that going to support a large tree? If it can't support the weight of my trowel, it's certainly not going to support the weight of a tree, never mind the nutrient and water requirements of a tree. There's just no soil here, or at least not enough. 
it's fine for grasses and things like that and little weeds and things that grow above the tree line, but not enough for a big tree. All right? There's not a lot of nutrients in there. There's not a lot of soil to retain anything. Okay, periodic disturbances. Okay, those certainly affect what can grow in an area. Okay, in this picture, obviously, there's been recently a what? Yeah, fire. All right, fire is a periodic disturbance that in our area, you know, forests have to deal with. How do they deal with it? Well, they die. Okay, I mean, that's as simple as that. As a tree gets burned, it's dead. Okay, but what that does is it changes the availability of the other resources. Okay, first off, Fire is often necessary for the seeds of pine trees to be opened and activated. They're usually sealed in special cones that have a resin on them, and the fire will melt that resin or burn that resin off, and then the pine cone will crack. And when it cracks, the seeds come out. So it actually requires fire in order for the seeds to be released. Once the seeds are released, then the new plants can grow. Why is that a good strategy? Why don't you want those seeds to grow when all those plants are alive? Well, they might all die at once and be... Okay, that might be part of it, but the other part of it would be... Okay, there's going to be more nutrients available and more... Decreases competition, that's the big thing. These plants are dead. They're not trying to take water out of the soil. Okay, they're not blocking as much sunlight, okay, because they don't have any leaves left on them anymore, but they block enough that there's not high intensity sunshine shining on a tiny little sapling that probably couldn't take it. Okay, when they plant, when they clear cut a, a slope and they plant the trees there, the mortality rate is about half. Okay, about half of those little trees that they plant when they clear cut an area die because they can't take the intense sunshine that's directed on them. They're supposed to be growing in the shadow of their dead parents. Okay, but when you take the, the, the parents away, okay, the sun can beat down on them. I, I know that sounds morbid, but that's what it is. Okay, those seeds, those little saplings aren't, they, they can't take that direct sunlight. It's too much for them when they're small. Okay, so this helps to distribute the nutrients in a way that reduces competition and releases them in a timely fashion for the new growth. Okay, so that's important. That's why they don't try and stop naturally caused forest fires as much as they used to. Okay, they let them go because they know how important that is for redistributing the nutrients. Okay, tornadoes can be another one. Floods, okay, we saw last year that when those floods came, what was there a whole bunch of down in the river valley after the water receded? Silt, okay, and what's that silt full of? Nutrients, huge amounts of nutrients. After a flood, you notice how fast all the, all the weeds kind of picked up and grew down in there and all the grasses grew again? Because they just got this huge deposit of nutrients from other places on the floodplain. Okay, so floods actually really help to redistribute nutrients. Okay, hurricanes, same thing. Okay, you get lots of, you know, older trees get blown over, younger trees get a new chance to grow, okay, and stuff like that. Okay, now, if it was a volcanic eruption on the other hand, that's kind of an extinction event, you know, like if you have, uh, let's say in Hawaii, lava flowing over the, the slope, yeah, everything is dead, okay? Everything is dead, sealed in rock, okay? The soil is destroyed. It takes quite a bit longer for the organisms to kind of take over again, but in a kind of eruption like Mount St. Helens where it's mostly ash, okay, that ash is full of lots of nutrients that help the plants to grow afterwards. All right, and then there's the biotic factors, okay? What kind of animals and, and bacteria and especially decomposers are there recycling the nutrients, okay? Um, and we've already, we don't need to talk about this stuff. So good, we got through it all. Okay, uh, two different types of plants here, guys. We'll talk about those tomorrow. Okay.